pleasure to be here with you today to talk about one of my favorite subjects, and that's the entity of the local board of education. Uh, I'm one of the strange ones, I know, uh, particularly in the ranks of superintendency. We all have more stories that we could tell, and I'm going to tell a few. I'm going to hide the identity to protect the guilty. Uh, but I think that some of these e examples will be illustrative to you and, and help kind of put things in perspective. You know, the question always arises, why do we even have school boards? Well, school boards are a tenant of American democratic government, basically. And we have our roots at the New England town meetings where people would get together and discuss issues and discuss concerns and discuss how to solve problems. And the Board of Education is meant to be a conduit to the community, to be able to be the liaison between the school district, the governance team, and the community, to be the champion of the public school system. That's why we have school boards. Now, why do we have superintendents? Because somebody has to run the show. Somebody has to be in charge. And that's the superintendent of schools. And we say to superintendents, the school boards association can be your best friend. And we should be your best friend because we're on your side. We're on the side of making sure that children get the kind of educational opportunities that they need and that they deserve and that they have to have if we're all going to have a productive society. Superintendent can't do it alone. The school board can't do it alone, but the superintendent and the school board, when they're working together, can accomplish an awful lot. To say that these are trying times is an understatement. I mean, I am a political junkie. I guess I have to be to do what I do for, for a living. I have sat back over the past, what, six months, nine months since the presidential season has been going on just in utter disbelief watching the alleged debates about hand sizes and other things mm -hmm. that when that came out of Rubio's mouth in Charleston I said you've got to be kidding me. We have reached a new low. Our kids are seeing this. They're hearing this. We need to be the adults in the room. We need to set an example. We need to lead. That's what the superintendent does. That's what the superintendent in cooperation with the Board of Education does. I've had the opportunity to work with school boards, school board members, superintendents all across the country. I've been doing this for 37 years. That's a long, long time. And. Uh, when I talk with folks, when I talk to new superintendents, particularly new superintendents that have just come into the state, and I say to them, do you know about this organization? And they'll say, well, a little bit, but tell me more about it. How is the organization governed? And I always start out by saying I have a 30-member board of directors, and immediately the look is, oh my God, 30 members, you're kidding me. <laughs> No, nope, I'm not. Now, how have I survived all these years having such a big board? I'm going to share some ideas with you. I'm going to give you some advice at the end about how to work cooperatively with people to get the job done that you know that needs to be done. But let's flash back to 1979 when I first came on the scene. I was employee number three at NCSBA. We weren't the organization that we are today. We were a very small organization. There was Dr. Dingman, who was the executive director, his secretary, and me. So we were very, very small at that time. In 1979, there was a growing concern among the superintendents and the school boards in the state that the superintendent turnover was just getting out of hand and that something had to be done. It was just, I mean, people were leaving after four, five, seven, eight years, and, uh, you know, something had to be done. So Dr. Dingman suggested 
that uh, we set up a commission uh, that we involve the Administrators Association, NCASA, and we involve at that time the superintendent's uh, group that was affiliated with NCAE. And back in the day, in 79, NCAA did have a division of superintendents. And about all the superintendents in the state were members of that organization and NCASA's superintendent group. So we had this uh, three-group commission that uh, was going to look at what was going on in the relationships between boards of education and their superintendent, and individual board members and their board and their superintendent. So Raleigh said, you just got out of Chapel Hill, see what you can do. And so the first thing I did is call the dean, Bill Self, who was a former superintendent of Charlotte Mecklenburg when the Swan decision came down. He was very well respected, very well known, not only in North Carolina, but across the country. And a guy named Bob Patillo, who was a professor at Duke University. At that time, Duke had a fairly uh, uh, sizable uh, graduate school of education that they operated. So we involved Bob Patillo and Bill Self and myself, and we created this survey that we used to get uh, information from individual school board members, from school boards as a whole, and from superintendents about the relationship issues and what was going on. What was precipitating this huge turnover in superintendents in the state? Now, believe it or not, what we found out was not rocket science. What we found out after doing the survey, after doing the analysis of the data, after having meetings after meetings after meetings to talk about these things, what we found out was very simple. And intuitively, we knew all along anyway. And that is, the problem was that individual board members did not understand their role and responsibility in regard to the board as a whole and to the superintendent. And that the board as a whole did not understand its relationship with the superintendent. And that the superintendents didn't understand their roles and responsibilities and relationships with the board. So what we had is a classic uncertainty about who does what, who is in charge of what, etc. We also found, and this isn't going to come as a real shock to you, but what we found also as a corollary to this is that when there were turnovers in board seats, that you had a higher likelihood that there was going to be a separation of the superintendent and the new board. Now whether that was going to be the superintendent was going to get run off, whether he was going to get bought out, or whether he just said, you know, it's time to retire. And we also found that the more individuals on a board that changed at the same time, the more likely it was that the superintendent was going to live <coughs> one way or the other. Now when you stop and think about it, none of that should be a surprise to us, should it? It shouldn't, I don't think. I don't think. So what did, we decided organizationally that one of the things that we needed to do was to set up a development program for school board members that would provide them with some opportunities to get some training about just exactly what they were supposed to do as a school board member. And so we set that up in 1985, and it continues to this day, the NCSBA Academy of School Boardsmanship. And that program is modeled by many of our sister state school board associations across the country now. It's a formalized training program where board members have the opportunity to come 
and to learn about what they need to know to be good board members. Now, it's just like, though, going to church. Just because you go in the door and sit in the sanctuary does not mean that you get the message. So, you know, I need to say that to you because I understand that. I have been absolutely amazed over the years to hear what some board members say I said when they go back home after they've been at School Board 101. Now, School Board 101 is our training for newly elected and appointed school board members. We still have, I think there's three districts in the state that have appointed boards. The rest of them are elected. I always advise the superintendent, if you have a new school board member <coughs> elected or appointed, you go with them to 101. You go with them every time they go anywhere. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That's my ending advice. To them. Don't let them go out of town out of to another school board function unless you're with them. Because you need to you need to you need to be able to develop relationships with them. And that's important. But you also need to hear what is being presented to them because sometimes they mishear and sometimes they add a little bit to it. And sometimes they think it means everybody but them. It's the other board members it's directed to but not, not them. So you need to help bring this around to them. Um, so those, those things are extremely, extremely important. Now back as a number three staff person, I was <coughs> dispatched down to Eastern North Carolina to meet with a school board that was having some dysfunction. And I went in and come to find out one of the newly elected board members had decided it was her responsibility to go into the high school and to change students' schedule. Oh. And so she was sitting at the front door of the high school on a routine basis to change kids' schedules. And so when I talked with her about that, I said, you know, why did, why did you think you should be doing this? And her response was, somebody needs to do it and the people elected me to do it. And I said, no, they really didn't. What they elected you to do is to be part of a governance team that has oversight over what happens in your district and that provides leadership to the community and outreach to the community. You have professional educators that do what you're trying to do. And her response was, believe it or not, well, nobody ever told me that. My daughter said that the high school guidance counselor wasn't doing what she was supposed to do, so I figured I'd just come do it since I was been elected to the school board. Now, all of the all of the stories that I have don't end that that easy. That one happened to end pretty easy because the woman genuinely genuinely was trying to do good. But again, it's one of these situations where. They just need some education. <clears throat> now, I had a very good superintendent friend in a large, large school district in North Carolina. I had known this individual for years and years. When I first was a ninth grade physical science teacher, he had come into the school district and I happened to meet him and he remembered me and we became fairly good friends and he had, he left that school district went out of state went to another district went to another district came back here to a large district large district and uh, he was the superintendent of schools he had a board member 
that was the wife of a prominent uh, cardiac surgeon in that community. And Sam knows who I'm talking about. And she was elected to the board. She had a lot of contacts, a lot of uh, political clout. Um, she didn't get any attention from the superintendent. The superintendent, according to her, would not return her phone calls. Return your board members' phone calls. <laughs> if they call you, return their phone call. Don't ignore them. Even if they're, if, even if they're being difficult, return their phone calls. This superintendent was a brilliant man. But common sense he lacked and some interpersonal skills. So he, he tried to marginalize this woman. This woman was a master. And she got board members on her side one by one. She got elected chair. Now this was over a period of years. She got elected chair. Increasing strife between the board and the superintendent. So the superintendent calls me and said, Ed, would you come down and, and meet with the board? They, they need some attention. And if you could do it, I would appreciate it. So I did. I got down a little early, like I would typically do, to meet with the superintendent, to talk, you know, we talked about the weather, we talked about the basketball team, we talked about all this stuff. And I said, well, tell me about what's really going on on the board from your vantage point. And he said, oh, hell, it don't matter. I said, it does matter. What, tell me what's, what you think is going on. He said, they're trying to tell me what to do, and I'm the superintendent of schools. And I thought, not for long. Not for long. And it got time for us to go. And I said, Let's go, let's go in the session. He said, I'm not going. I said, you really need to. And he said, I don't care what you tell them. I said, you should. You should. You know how this story ended? He got run out of town. Bright man. But he was the superintendent of schools. You're the superintendent because your board decided you were going to be the superintendent. And they could easily just decide that you're not going to be the superintendent. Or they can make your life a living hell. They know how to do that. But nobody profits when that's the situation. When there is strife between the school board and the superintendent, the only people that profit are those people out there that want to point their finger back and say, see, the public school system is so dysfunctional it can never work. That's why we need charters. That's why we need vouchers. That's why we need to privatize this, because the public system is fundamentally broken. So we are giving the people that are opposed to public education, the bullets to put in their gun and shoot us. Now, we've got to do a better job. We're smarter than this. We've got to do a better job. We've got to be able to work together. Now, in the grand universe of board members that I have had the opportunity to get to know and to, to work with, there are some that, frankly, have a condition that I call OPD, obnoxious personality disorder. <laughs> there are some that have that. There are some superintendents that have it too. Anytime you have people as a, in a group, you're going to have people that have that problem. And you just have to acknowledge that and, and move on. But have to work cooperatively together for the good of the little kids that you purport to serve. Because the, the world that they're going to be faced with, they need every, every opportunity we can afford them to 
be able to have the skill set necessary to successfully maneuver in this rapidly changing environment and, and world and culture that we, that we have in the 21st century. And for a large number of children, you are their last hope. And I don't mean to be melodramatic, but I really believe that. That you are their last hope. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna get real personal here because I grew up three or four streets this way. And I can tell you that since, and that's been a long time ago, obviously, <laughs> but this area has changed a lot. And you can go a couple blocks in any direction and you can get from here and you can be in some really questionable difficult areas and I submit to you that those kids in 27262 this zip code have every right and every opportunity to get the kind of education that I got when I lived in this zip code and they're depending on the public education system in Guilford County and in North Carolina and in this country to provide them with those opportunities that they can have a chance to become all that they can be. And the option, if we don't do that, you know what the option is. Build bigger jails and warehouse them, but that's not an option. So we, you know, we got to make sure that we know what we're doing, that we have this relationship between the school board and the superintendent as a team that we're able to, to, to do that. Now, as I said, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of, a lot of people. And for the most part, I think that most people that run for a school board do it for the right purpose that they want to serve, that they want to be part of the solution. I really do believe that. There are some in other states, because the, I'm being videotaped here, so <laughs> in other states I'm talking about here. There are board members in other states that don't run for that reason, that may have some personal issues that they are trying to solve. Um, maybe their superintendent firing. Maybe they were a former teacher or principal. And the new guy came in and said, you need to, you need to go. You're not, you're not doing what you need to do. And we've got, we've got some of that. And we've had some of that. And we've had some board members that have been former employees that were pushed out because they didn't perform. And you know what? They ended up getting, getting elected and caused some difficulty. Those things happen. But as superintendent, I don't need to tell you this, but I'm going to. You need to, do, you need to make the calls that you need to make. And you need to make sure that, that you've got the, the data to make them, that you've got the documentation take action when you take action and that you're doing it for the right reason because that employee is not doing what they're supposed to do and that they have been through all the all the hoops about performance improvement and blah 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 you need to make sure of that and when you have to pull the trigger you have to pull the trigger I mean I've had to pull the trigger too many times myself and if the trigger has to be pulled it has to be pulled because you've got, a, you've got a job to do, and that's part of it. That is part of it. You need to make sure also that you don't create artificial boundaries and artificial problems between you and your board or members of your board. I remember a superintendent, longtime superintendent, that um, he came to 101 religiously with his new, newly elected board members. And uh, he did that every time he had one. And there was a young lady that had been elected, and he came with her. And so I'm uh, talking about 
the library that uh, a new board member should have. And one of the things that, this was obviously before everything was online, uh, one of the things was a copy of 115. It was 115 before it was 115C, so <coughs> that tells you how long ago this was. And I said, needs a copy of 115, uh, chapter 115 of the General Statutes of North Carolina, which is the public school laws. And this lady raised her hand and said, Ed, what if the superintendent won't get it for me? And I said, oh, he will. That's not a problem. That, you know, this, that, it's not a problem, it's 20 bucks, you know, that's not an issue. He will not. And the superintendent's sitting right there beside him. He's doing this number. And I said, uh, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said to myself, I need to move along somehow and get, get off this right now tactfully. And I did, and we took a break, and the superintendent came up to me and I said, why? Why won't you get her a copy of 115? Ed, she he put his, Ed, she doesn't need it. All she will do is cause trouble if she gets that. And I said, you know what? You have just created a monster. She thinks there's something in there. That, you guys have looked at 115. Now, it's a snooze fest if you start <laughs> reading through it. And But she, in her mind, because the superintendent told her that she was not going to get a copy of that, that became a line in the sand. Now, isn't that stu a stupid line to put in the sand over, over a copy of 115? Really? And you know what? He never survived because you know what she did? She gradually got all the board on her side because he had done something like that to every single one of them. How stupid can a smart man be? So just because you went to Chapel Hill and got a PhD or wherever, doesn't mean that you got good common sense. You know, there are times that you do have to draw a line. But you got to know when to draw it. And it's not over something like giving a newly elected board member a copy of the public school laws of North Carolina. So that's, a, that's an example of a superintendent being book smart and people stupid. I'm not going to pretend that it's easy to work with a school board or any board. Jack has a board. And even though there are fine superintendents that are on your board, they're still a board. And working for a board can be difficult. And you just have to understand that there are unique personalities on that board that you need to be able to work with. And just because they were elected to your school board or appointed to your school board, doesn't mean that you're gonna be best friends with them just because they're there. You know, it doesn't mean that. And you don't have to be. But what you do have to do is to respect them and to respect their position. And a long, long time ago, when I first went into a classroom to teach physics and chemistry, back in the day, I was 22 years old. The kids were high school juniors and seniors. Many of them looked older than me, believe it or not. And, uh, some of them I liked and some of them, you know, I didn't particularly care for. Them. But I said to myself, you know, what I need to do is to try to find something about every kid that I either like or respect and fixate on that when the bad thoughts come in my head. And you know what? 
that was pretty insightful for a 22 year old kid to come up with that. And I say that to you as a superintendent, that whenever somebody comes on your board, if you don't, if they campaign against you or against an initiative that you're supporting or whatever, try to find something about them that you like or respect. Try to find something about them as individuals that you like and respect. And that can be the foundation of a positive relationship. Now, when you go to our, our stuff, when your board members come, again, you need, to go, you need to go with them. Uh, the car time to get there is very important. The time there is very important because you get to know them. If you get to be a quite good acquaintances or quasi friends or whatever with them, it's easier to disagree agreeably than if you just can't stand the ground they walk on. And when, the, when you think about it, it makes you mad. Now, true confession, there are individuals that when I think about them, I get mad. Just because they irritate me so bad. And I'm sure you all have people like that. But if you find yourself feeling that way about one of your board members, you need to try to talk to yourself and talk it, yourselves out of that. Because that's not going to be productive for your mental health and for your physical health if you get physically revolted when they come into your boardroom. I mean, you just need to try to work away from it. This is a very important thing that, that you've chosen to do for a living. You hold the future in your collective hands with your, with your school board. I don't know of any more important tasks that anyone has to mold the future of your community, our state, in this country, in this world, than what you do for supporting public schools. This is, um, this is a mission that I think that we all have and that we all share. And I'm, I'm very passionate about it. Um, back several years ago when I had my, pardon me, this is, a, this is a story that I think is gonna illustrate how important I think all this is. When I had my first colonoscopy, uh, the drug that they gave me did not knock me out. It just, it just, you know, I was just, whatever it was, it didn't knock me out. And I talked, the doctor talked to me the whole time that the procedure was going on. And he talked to me about the North Carolina School Boards Association and what I did for him. And after it was over, he said, you know what? He said, I've never done a procedure on anybody like that that was so excited to tell me about what he did for a living. And I said, well, that's, <laughs> that's the passion that I think I have for the work that we try to do. Um, let me now just kind of throw this out and see if I can't answer any questions or if you have any comments. If you want to say, Ed, you're full of stuff, uh, that's fine. Yes, sir. Good to see you. Um, I have an advertisement and then a, a question for okay. you. Uh, last year at the end of my first year as superintendent, I went with three of our five board members to the summer mm -hmm. leadership conference at right. Carolina Beach. Right. My wife and my two children we went. We all spent the week together with the board. I thought it was, it was a great experience. In addition to the fact that w the sessions were really great quality, just the time that we were able to spend together, I think they saw me as a real person and we've had great and growing relationships Good. since then. Good. And that's sort of the, the basis of my question. There was a dissertation completed three, year, three or four years ago at Western Carolina that talked about <coughs> this distance between boards and superintendents in terms of the conditions that need to be created for superintendents to be successful. Mm -hmm. So what advice do you have for us as superintendents about how we, of course we take our job seriously, we know that it's big responsibility, we know it's stressful. 
we know that going into it. But how do we create conditions with our board so that there's an understanding among our board members about what they could do to help us to make this a long-term proposition? Great question. I think some of the some of the just simple things that, that you can do that will facilitate that positive working relationship with them is to treat all of them alike. Uh, when one of them has a question, uh, wants information about something, send the information to everybody. Uh, do not have favorites on the board, even though as a human being you're going to have them, but don't let them know that you like one better than, than the other. You want to nurture that environment that everybody is an equal member of the team and that they're all important. You need to treat them the way you want to be treated. And that's what we talk about. One, one of the things we talk about in uh, School Board 101, that as a board member, Board members should not try to surprise the superintendent and play gotcha with the superintendent at a public board meeting because nobody likes to be embarrassed. By the same token, the superintendent shouldn't do that to the board either. In other words, the board members individually and collectively and the superintendent need to treat each other with honor and with respect. And to, you know, back in the day, in elementary Bible school, I was taught the golden rule. You know, treat people the way you want to be treated and it will come back to you. So creating that culture there, it's, it's hard work, but it's something that, that needs to be done. Yeah. Um, how do you, when you're dealing with that possible board member that thinks that one individual position as a board member, uh -huh allows them to have free autonomy and act outside of a collective board. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have to assist or to help the board chair or the others bring that together? Well, I think that you, you set up the culture that it is the board as a unit and that, it, that, that has the authority, which is true, which is the law. Uh, you need to have a, a wonderful relationship develop a wonderful relationship with your chairman so that the chair can handle the individual board member that is doing something inappropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to you don't want to take that role. Uh, you want to have the chair or someone on the board to police the other board members. But in order to do that, that relationship has to be there between the superintendent and the, and the board chair so that you can feel free to go to the chair and not feel like that, that, that it's a sign of weakness because it isn't, but to say to the chair, I'm having trouble with Ben. This is what Ben is doing and I need you to step up to the plate.